Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We are live. This is Collapse Club. I am David Baum in Seattle. I am joined by my friend, Wendy Freeman, who is in Portugal. Hi, everyone. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We are live. This is Collapse Club. Whoa, we have a, this brings up a thing. I am joined by my friend. This is, the first, this is the first time that we have done a live broadcast and there are some technical things that we don't yet fully understand. So if you hear weird things going on, uh, I ask you to forgive us. We'll figure it out. One day this will be routine and we will be completely confident uh, that day is not yet today, but we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead. So, why is this live? I have done some interviews before that were recorded uh, and uh, had uh, some very good conversations. The truth is I cannot take the editing anymore. Editing, I can't handle it. Uh, it takes a lot of time, a lot of thinking, um, and time is better spent actually talking to people. Further, being live like this means that the mistakes we make are our mistakes. And the good things we say are spontaneously said. So it's about being on the spot and being as close to we can as being in the room and being real. So this is an experiment and uh, I will admit I'm very nervous, but I assume it's all going to work out. And thank you very much for joining us in this wonderful experiment. Uh, one thing, oh, there we go. And I was gonna say, you can write in the chat and we have some wonderful people. There is Seattle Georgian Song, hi. And Andre Clemens, hello, hello, thank you. And Kat, Kat. thank you, Kat. So nice to see you here. <laughs> Uh, if you feel like it, please uh, uh, write in the chat at your convenience. Today's topic is beginnings. This is the first of uh, the live broadcast. So this is a beginning. And the topic of starting things in the time of collapse is rather poignant. Because if you believe that our society and our world face substantial challenges that may lead to really substantial transformation, things may not be as they are now. And some of the things that we set out to do now may not be possible to do. So why start? Let me uh, ask you, Wendy, when you think about beginning things, what do you think about? For me, beginnings always starts with some kind of a seed. So whether it's human beginnings, and I'm not, I'm not particularly talking about childbirth and, and babies, but human beginnings for me often start with education or an idea that comes from somewhere. So reading that I've done or conversations that I've had where just this, this etheric moment happens, which has happened between us so many times, where just in a conversation, there's just this idea that pops up and become something, becomes a real thing. And I'm sure that's how architecture works as well. And people are sort of dreaming and they picture a particular way that a window is going to work or a whole house is going to work and it becomes a thing. I like that. I think uh, the point is that our visions, our visions can be bigger than the, the futures that we imagine. Uh, even if we look at the potential future history of the earth and see a difficult story, nevertheless, it is both possible and indeed in some sense our duty to create visions and imaginations that transcend that or penetrate to the core of that so that we can understand how love and humanity uh, exist even through the devastation of collapse. Yep. Okay, check, uh, stepping back a bit, let's check in. Um, <laughs> in our excitement I, to start. 
Sorry. In our excitement to start, we just jumped in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're figuring out how to do this. This is not a trivial matter. So I'm David. I'm in Seattle. Um, it is uh, one in the afternoon here. It, it is a fine day uh, after a long period of rain and cold. A check-in is a thing where uh, you share who you are, what you're doing. Uh, and one technique to do it is uh, to share a concern and a gratitude. My concern lately has been uh, my girlfriend got food poisoning and was really terribly sick for about 24 hours. In these current times with the pandemic raging all around, that is a very frightening condition for two reasons. First, uh, is it COVID? COVID sometimes presents as gastrointestinal distress. Uh, so is it COVID? And then even if it isn't COVID, if she is having a really, really difficult time and needs to go to the emergency room for fluids and other treatment, uh, what's the situation over at the ER? Well, it's crowded, wait times are long, the doctors are tired, uh, and there, there's COVID in the ER. So things that would normally be a uh, run-of-the-mill problem at home can, can become very scary because the resources that we're used to are under a lot of pressure from the pandemic. And I think this is something that people in uh, places like here, Seattle, Washington, United States, are going to have to get used to where certain services and material supplies that we're used to having at the flip of a switch or at a phone call are not available. So that, that's my concern. My gratitude is that the situation resolved on its own. It turned out to be simple food poisoning, and 24 hours later, uh, my friend is feeling a lot better. Uh, so I feel like we scraped by. But the feeling of fear and of being on one's own uh, when someone's in pain and suffering, very difficult and uh, sort of enlightening as to some of the consequences or the circumstances we may face going forward. So that's my check-in. Uh, very glad to be here, as I say, nervous, calming down now a little bit. Whew, one day this will be routine and I'll be very glad. Absolutely. Wendy, would you like to check in about yourself? Well, I'm very glad to hear that she's feeling better and that that crisis is over. So that's, that's good news and I'm, I'm kind of grateful for that too. I'm Wendy and I'm in Portugal in Europe and it's 9 p.m. my time here. We've had some sunny weather and I've been gardening and today I went to visit a friend and helped him with his garden. So that's kind of the space that I'm in at the moment is even though it's winter here, we're able to be outside. Um, and it's interesting, my concern and my gratitude are kind of mixed up. So I'm concerned that it's dry because this is the time of year we normally get most of our rain and checking the stats, it's well below usual. So we're 65% of what we would normally have had by now. And that's really problematic long term. But it's, it's quite interesting because the mind keeps flipping between the two. One is it's really great to go out in the middle of winter and have bright sunshine and it's really pleasurable. But at the back of your mind is this concern that it's just, it's just not normal. So I'm really grateful for the sunshine and I've really been enjoying it. But uh, part of me is, I think, also the similar sort of thing to what you're saying. There's a momentary gratitude or a mom momentary deep concern, but it kind of builds that anxiety about how things are going. And the weather here is beautiful, but not going in the right direction. So that's, that's how I am this evening. Thank you. All right, well, let's jump into it uh, about the beginning of things. I'll, I'll start. Uh, this broadcast uh, is meant to reach out to a wide community of people. There are a lot of people around the world who are uh, part of the collapse aware community, people who are aware that the situations uh, in society and in the earth systems are on the brink of collapse, in terrible, terrible trouble, 
showing all manner of disturbing behavior, extremes, unstable behavior. Um, a lot of people know this and you can feel as you troll the internet, uh, you can feel the fear and chaos that people are beginning to respond to. There are lots of ways that this can go. Uh, there are a lot of responses to it. I am really interested in reaching out to the widest possible community and hearing from uh, the many people who have things to say and who are living lives in response to the prospect of collapse. There is no one wisdom, that's my belief. Uh, when I started looking into this two years ago, I thought I was pretty smart. I thought that I had read a lot and understood a lot. And uh, I realized pretty quickly reading other people that I don't know much of anything. And more importantly, that everyone has their own wisdom. People bring their own uh, intelligence and their own experience, uh, their own journey to the discussion of collapse and what to do about it, how to respond to it. And so the purpose of this enterprise, this collapse club, this repeated online interview, uh, discussion, conversation, uh, place, space. The purpose is to gather the kaleidoscope of human wisdom to uh, hear and learn and see uh, what the human community does in response to the prospect of collapse. So there's only one way to begin. A journey of a thousand miles begins under your feet. I'm so grateful to have at the beginning, my friend, Wendy, who uh, is full of wisdom and has been, we have worked together uh, in certain communities uh, for, for a year or more. Um, and it's been a joy to learn from her. Wendy, I'd like you to talk about your garden and how that uh, serves as your response to the prospect of collapse. Happy to do that, David. I have um, some pictures for everyone. So I'm sharing those at my second moment for them to come up. I realized quite a long time ago that um, we were at the beginning of something very different for society and, and the world as I knew it. I was living in London at the time. And I did quite a lot of research and I had lived in Portugal at one stage before. And I came across to Portugal and looked at land and yeah, we, we're not going to talk for very long. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about it, but I decided to buy a small, a small farm here. And my purpose was to practice permaculture. That felt like the kind of thing I wanted to begin in the face of so many potential endings that I could see around yeah, the economy in London to me didn't look very strong and I, I wasn't sure what my place would be in a, in a scenario where a lot of things that I was used to doing or had good skills in were no longer valuable or were no longer available. You know, who knew we had the 2008 crash after I kind of had my thinking about this. So I came across to Portugal and I bought this small piece of land that had been used as um, pasture for some horses who you would see occasionally in the background of the photos. And it was just grass. And I've had volunteers come over who are familiar with or learning about permaculture, which is a, a wonderful um, design system that steals quite a lot from indigenous ideas, but is a, a sort of a, a more engineered way of approaching agriculture around organic and, and things like that. And I've been working with ideas that people have given me and books that I've read to change the land here. And it's hugely different over the three years that I've been on this property. And sometimes when I look out of my window and see how that field of grass has become a small food forest full of fruit trees, and I have this beautiful herb spiral that one of my sweetheart volunteers, Secret, built for me outside my kitchen, that now you can hardly see the bricks that she built with just two years later. And there's this wisteria that we planted from seed that in summer just takes over the whole front of the property. And there's just this, this renewing through nature. I mean, some of the slides are what it looks like in winter where everything kind of dies down and we get quite hard frost here. 
And there's always a cycle in nature that humans are so out of where things die down and then the seeds are there and from a new beginning, everything comes back. And I have to say for me, I wouldn't be able to do the volunteering work that I do in the community um, and the energy that I put into that if I wasn't able to come and sit in this garden every morning and just appreciate. And actually it looks really amazing. And I have to say, I don't actually work that hard on it. This is nature's doing. I've kind of moved things around and put some stones in place and maybe a bit of decking so we can really sit and enjoy things. Wendy, but, can, you, can you click into uh, a large view of these pictures? Ah, they full screen on mine. Are you only seeing them really tiny? I'm seeing the uh, catalog view rather than the individual picture view. Ah, that's interesting. So it's not, I was looking at a slideshow on my screen. No, not yet. Is that, is that better? No, it's the same. It's showing the, uh, the whole collection of them rather than an individual photo. Um, Thank you perhaps, everyone for your patience. Perhaps. Uh, um, yeah. If I bring them up full screen here, David, oh, I'll tell you what it's doing. Let me stop the sharing and share the enlarged view. There we go. <laughs> sorry, you. everybody. This is the patio that I, oh, sorry. Yeah. So I was watching a slideshow, but you couldn't see what I was watching. Okay, we know for next time. So I'll give you the technical detail on that later. So this is towards the end of the slideshow because I've been chatting for a while. This is what my garden looks like now when I look out my kitchen door, and none of this was there before. This used to just be grass outside there. This amazing red colored flower here is a pineapple sage, which is just the best plant in the world. A friend gave me that. And here's some um, produce from my garden. And this is this wisteria that I mentioned that's been growing from seed. That's just really huge now. And I think that that was the that was the end of the slideshow. Go back to the beginning, please, <laughs> so we can see the... I will do. Give me a sec. I've learned something here. Great. Uh, at least I think I have right now, I have. Sorry, David. I'll no problem, it. no, this is... We're going to figure this out. This will be routine one day. Right. Oh, look That's at that. That's the poor little house that I bought. Oh, my. It's beautiful. <laughs> With this terrible grass, this huge, this tree is a magnificent black walnut, but it's absolutely underneath it. You can see it's absolutely covered with brambles. So this completely changed. That's the beginning of planting all the fruit trees. This is looking away from the house. Yeah. And you'll see, I'm just going to click through. I mean, that's what the house looked like before. It was really in a bit of, a, not a ruin, but really in quite a state. And then just slowly through the seasons, I had builders in, so I didn't do the work on the house myself. Oh, look at that. But they basically redid most of the back of the house and put the, the kitchen that I'm sitting in now is this long room that you see underneath where they're putting the new roof. Oh. All new windows. You see the fruit trees slowly coming up. The occasional <laughs> rainbow just to encourage. This is my view out my kitchen. The moon rising. Slowly things coming together. And just interesting every year to keep the photographs, to look back at how it seemed almost done and then a whole new idea comes up. And it really is just an idea. You look out the window and go, oh, I could, I could move those rocks or put a flower bed outside the kitchen. This was just an empty space with grass. And the, my friend Secret built this for me, which has turned out to be an absolute joy. So you can see the wisteria very quickly climbing up that pillar in the middle. A heart-shaped path. One of my friends, the pony. Yeah. And just that view changing completely. I wish for everyone to have a view of nature, a tree outside their window or something. I find it incredibly nourishing to watch what's changed today about the view outside my window. You can. Uh, yeah, go ahead. 
You can hardly see the house in summer now with the trees. How long have you been on the property? I started planting trees here in 2018. I moved in at the end of the year because they, they had to make the house habitable. There was no electricity or water in the house when I bought it. And how did you find Portugal as a destination for yourself? I lived here for a while on a, a job working in a retreat and I didn't know it, but when I came and, and did, had this just out of the blue offer from a friend to come and work on his yoga retreats, I really liked what's here. So for me, Portugal is a very ancient country. Um, there's a lot of deep history here. They have standing stones that are older than, than Stonehenge. And you kind of feel it in some of the towns that humans have lived in these spaces and, and nurtured these spaces, stewarded nature here for a very long time. It's not by any means perfect. In my mind, they're doing a lot of things wrong with big plantations of eucalyptus, for example, some questionable ideas about lithium mining and things like that. But it's a lovely little country with, I think, everything of the best that Europe has to offer. And for the moment, very stable weather. So who knows which direction that will go in. But um, this is the, the amazing pineapple sage that I'm talking to, which you couldn't see. <laughs> and that you can hardly see the house now. It's, it's quite fabulous. Yeah, it's just lovely. Do you find that uh, making the garden connects you with the people that are in the community where you live? Absolutely. I have a lovely space in the, in the backyard, which is partially covered in summer, and we have product swaps there. Mm. So I'm very much trying to introduce some of these concepts around sharing economy, degrowth, um, a new economy in a very practical way. You know, have people around to my house, have to explain carefully that, no, you don't put a dollar price or a euro price on the things. You actually just offer them. And let someone come to you and offer a service or a swap or, I mean, what actually ends up happening is people move into their own generosity. And we've had people arrive here with boxes of stuff that they don't need, beautiful stuff, you know, nothing, not garbage. And just say, look, we actually have a date this afternoon. We can't stay, but just give this away. If anyone wants it, just give it away. Someone brought last time a, a barrow load. And when I say a barrow, like a fancy garden barrow that had about 50 kilograms of potatoes mm. and said, just give them away. And you can just see people shifting into this mode of, if we're a village and we know each other, we can give something today and get something back at another time. So for me, the community, the, the feeling in the community is changing. So there's something beginning in that way here as well, which is lovely to see. For me, the people around me, some of them have been here their whole lives and they, their grandfather built this house that I'm in. So. Do you find <clears throat> that the sense of community gives you a buffer against the chaos and confusion of collapse that is engulfing the world? I have a little ways to go because I don't speak Portuguese well, but I have every intention of completing my studies and getting to the point where I can really talk Portuguese. But I do, even though I'm a little bit on the outside because of the language, I do feel like the people that have lived here for a long time are so grounded and they're so practical, so, so practical that this is really a good space to be if things go wrong with a lot of the systems that we're in. They've survived worse. You know, they've really, they've been here for a long time. Their families have family history of going through the communist regime, which ended in the 70s and all sorts before that. Has it uh, made a change in you as a person to uh, work in uh, in nature like that? Did you know how to garden before you started or did, or did you learn everything as you went along? My mom is a genius gardener. She really is. And we always had a really big productive vegetable garden when I was a child in South Africa. So I, I guess I've imbibed. I kind of have a green thumb. I'm kind of really lucky with with growing things, but I didn't, I mean, I lived in an apartment in London. So farming or sort of big scale gardening is new to me, but um, two things, it keeps you really fit because it's a lot of digging and carrying heavy stuff and being in the sun. And that's all, all really positive. 
But at a deeper level, part of me has shifted. I'm much more patient and much more accepting. And there's really this beautiful story that people tell. It's not, it's not my, I, I don't know who came up with it first, but when a tree grows, we just accept a tree in any shape or form that it comes up. You know, no one ever goes past a tree and goes, oh, you know, the tree's to this or to that. It's just a tree. It's exactly perfect the way it is. And I have to say, I very rarely have perfect plants. And they, the pests are always there. And, and yeah, things never go quite according to plan. But this is how nature works. And it's taught me something. That you'll smile now, David. But I definitely apply that logic that shifted in me when I'm dealing with bullshit in, in, on Facebook. It's like everyone's got an opinion. Everyone's growing in a different way. Everyone's grown different soil. They have different ideas. They, they're thinking in different colors. It's all right. It's just a question of how do you get, you know, a bunch that want to, how do you get them to work together or how do you get plants to grow together? And that's kind of more of a stewarding thing than, than our, I think our idea of leadership or pushing people to be in a certain way. So I think gardening's changed me deeply in that way. That is beautiful. Thank you. Oh, thank you, David. We're approaching 25 minutes and the goal for these broadcasts is about 30 minutes. The, the yep. point here is to be short and sweet and uh, repeated. I wanna do many of these and keep them nice and compact. So uh, that, was, that was beautiful. Thank you for sharing about your garden. Pleasure. The last thing I uh, want to do, and this I hope will become a regular feature is that the participants each time will off will make an offering. So this segment is called Offerings. And what it is, is a uh, book or a, a website or uh, an organization or a teacher or something that you want to offer to the community. So I asked you in advance and uh, the listings are in the description of the video, but could you tell us about what you want to offer today? I will. So I am a big fan and a, a supporter, financial supporter of an organization called Yes Magazine or Yes Media. And this came about through my interest in uh, what they call positive journalism. So positive journalism is something fairly new, which is ridiculous. You would think it would be the way we do journalism. But the idea is to investigate a bit deeper and talk about solutions so report on the problems, but always look to see if victims of a crime or people who are suffering from a weather disaster, how are they dealing with that? You know, what's the next step after you publish the horrible photographs, the disaster photographs? What do people do after that? So I subscribe to Yes Magazine online, and I have found it incredibly helpful in just expanding my ideas of that disasters happen to everyone and people have bad luck. But there's so many brilliant ideas that people are so strong and deal with it. You know, there are ways of dealing with just about everything. So I found it really great and I highly recommend it. Quite uplifting. Thank you. And the list, the uh, link to Yes Magazine is in the description below this video. My offering is a philosopher I just discovered. It's a fellow called Ian McGilchrist and there's a link to one of his videos in the description. He has just written a book called The Matter with Things. Uh, his previous book was called The Master and His Emissary. And Ian McGilchrist, uh, first of all, he's a jolly old fella, but incredibly erudite and with an education. He has more education in his little pinky than I have in my entire body. Um, but he's lovely to listen to. The video linked is an interview with John Cleese of Monty Python. Oh, yeah. They have a great, a great discussion. Well, Mr. McGillchrist's area of study is the different functions of the left and right brain hemispheres, but it's not physiological science. It is, uh, it is about the human mind. Mm -hmm. And to sum it up quickly, uh, it turns out that human beings have two different minds working at the same time. And those two different kinds of mind 
correlate with the hemispheres of the brain uh, in a very subtle and fascinating way, and he goes into it. Uh, but uh, a caricature of a summary is that the left brain is about the, the right hand, for most of us, reaching out and grabbing food, identifying a single thing. We want it, we grab it, we take it. It also includes language and words and categories and uh, making things general and comp uh, lining them up. The right brain is about the entire picture, a comprehensive understanding of what's going on. And the types of attention are different and what they see is different and how they handle it is different. And uh, I won't attempt to summarize. I just commend you to, to listen to him because it turns out that in our modern day, the left brain is dominating. We reach out, we grab, we control, we take. And uh, it turns out that several times in history, the rise of left brain thinking has corresponded with the collapse of society. He's also just wonderful to listen to. So my offering is Ian McGilchrist. You can start with the John Cleese interview and then just uh, search on YouTube for, for his name and you'll find a lot of informative and entertaining material. That's it for today. This has been we survived, marvelous. David. We survived. Nerve wracking, I'm telling you. <laughs> One reason I had to do this was I felt like the energy was just going to burst out of my body and uh, blow me apart. And I needed to be in connection with you, Wendy, and hopefully then with the entire community going forward. Please subscribe if you like to uh, this uh, channel. You'll get notifications. If you click the little bell, you'll get notified when we're going live. I have one more scheduled following here with uh, Melissa Allison and Jens Holtman, some very independent thinkers about how to respond to collapse, some fairly idiosyncratic views on the theme of independence. So you'll see that listing in the channel. That hope sounds great. Hope you'll join us. Um, Wendy, any last words? David, thank you for doing this. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to, yeah, I love chatting with you anyway, but I'm excited about the rest of the series. Thank you. I, I uh, love chatting with you as well. Farewell, everyone. Uh, until we meet again, see you soon. Bye, everyone. <laughs>